David, Kathleen, and Jamie are all here in studio tonight. Jamie, you told me just the other day that you've never seen a leader from any party who wasn't nervous on the night of a debate. That's right, Peter, and that's why preparation for debates are a bespoke proposition, not a cookie-cutter one, because you have to do whatever your candidate needs, and they're all extremely nervous. So, really, that last 24 hours is about making them comfortable and getting them to be as loose as they can so they can perform effectively. All right, we're in that last 24-hour cycle, and for many of the leaders, they've been prepping for weeks, if not months, for this moment. What do you do in that last 24 hours instead of, uh, 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 as well as just trying to make mm -hmm. them comfortable? Well, I agree with what Jamie said, but I would give every candidate the same advice my mother gives me, which is go to bed early. Because <laughs> a good night's sleep basically can solve almost anything. So sleep, be with your family, relax the night before. Actually, debate day, a lot of people don't realize, is actually pretty busy. Most leaders have a small media availability, but then you have to go to the site to check your wardrobe, to make sure the cameras are okay with it, do voice checks, um, and then you go back for actual the debate night. Um, busy at the war room, people are preparing fact checks and, uh, and, and scrambling as well. So staff are quite busy on debate day as well. David, what do you remember, debate day? Well, I think I agree with them. It's actually the least uh, consequential part of the debate preparation in the sense of for months now they will have been going through binders and briefing books and learning and learning how to spar back and forth. And then for the last number of weeks, they'll have been doing mock debates where they're playing off against their people playing in for their opponents and doing those things and learning how to perform the debate. But by the time you get to this point, that all needs to get done. I suspect that the leaders had their last mock debate today. Mm -hmm. um, and tonight they'll be off, and tomorrow, with the exception of the routine things that Kathleen was talking about, they'll be off. The last thing you want to be doing at noon of the day of the debate is trying to cram new facts or arguments into the person's head. Paul Bray said today that he went and played nine holes of golf, right? Mm. That's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it worked for him on yeah. at least one it debate. Um, tell me, give me a, some concrete tool. What's the, like, what's the last thing you whisper in their ear before they go in there? Well, I think um, David makes a good point. You don't want to jam too much into the leader's brain. So what I would focus on is actually telling them what, instead of saying, don't do this and make sure you don't overreact here, this is what you need to accomplish in this debate. Set out the goals of every debate. You have to remember that debates aren't like QP, right? Aren't like question period that we see in the House where you just, opposition leaders get to ask a question and then there's an answer. They're a very different format. You have four different leaders at tomorrow night's event and they'll be coming at all different angles and you both can ask questions but you also have to respond. So focus on what they have to achieve. You know, we, when we were watching that pack earlier of some of the debate highlights, it got really intense between, especially Mulroney and Turner. Can you actually practice that kind of stuff in prep where it gets that intense? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And in fact, um, uh, unless I've only worked for bad leaders, quite often they lose those mock debates. Um, and, uh, right? and that's, that's part of preparation is you get people in there who are going to do the best job of playing the other leaders as possible. And their job is not to go light. Their job is to go as hard as the others will. So I don't know if you can summon that electricity because the stakes are not the same mm -hmm. as they are in that moment. But you certainly, they can get quite hostile and leaders can get very hostile mm -hmm. at their staffs or whoever are playing the, uh, the alternative leaders. Yeah, and end up not talking to them when it's done, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think they went too, you said they that went too far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> like, I can't believe that. Right? <laughs> um, I, I want to show you a, a clip from the, the last debate. Um, I'll show it to you first, then explain why. Watch this. This money was supposed to be spent on the border. You spent it 300 kilometers away. Okay, let's get that kind of that kind of deception undermines confidence in your leadership. Uh, once again, Mr. Gnatty, if you're you're citing a report that the Auditor General's office said should not be relied upon. All right, what I find interesting about that, and you kept seeing it throughout the debate, is Stephen Harper made a conscious decision not to look at who was questioning him but instead to look directly into cameras. So they must have thought that through, that this has a more direct relationship to the audience. Now, I get at this because, not, not wanting to sound too shallow, it's not just about what you say in these debates, it's how you look saying it. Mm -hmm. So the argument there on, on looking direct into camera, why, 
why does that, why would they have thought that worked and perhaps it did work, I don't yeah. know. Well, typically in debates, um, the times that leaders look into the camera are an opening statement and closing statement when you're directly addressing the viewers. Um, but normally you don't, but they made that choice because they're almost trying to minimize Ignatieff. Um, but let's face it, TV doesn't come naturally to anyone, maybe to you, Peter, no, <laughs> but most people have a hard time at doing it. And so often the debate prep will bring in um, body language coaches. Um, I remember something that happened with Jack was he would nod when he was listening to every leader respond, but nodding indicates agreement most mm -hmm. often. So we actually had to teach him not <laughs> to nod. And, um, and that's why those people with those kind of skill sets around body language um, are very helpful. It's interesting but, to note that Paul Wells was telling us last week that to get around that, they're putting two cameras on each leader mm -hmm. tomorrow night. So if anybody's looking at the camera, they're going to switch the camera. Mm -hmm. Now, if there's little lights on him, they're going to see yeah, it's going back. And forth. Well, the Prime Minister yeah. also borrows that from how he answers questions in the House of Commons, right? Because when he stands to answer his questions, he doesn't look across at the person that questions him. He stands, he turns to the speaker and looks into the camera that is over the speaker's chair and mm -hmm. speaks directly to, to the audience. So I think his debate performance was, you know, an uh, uh, outcome of how he's answered questions for a long time. David, you wanted to make a point there? Uh, well, I was going to say, I actually think that that's a reasonable thing to do, and I think it's a smart thing to do, and we have often coached leaders that I've been involved in in debate prep to talk directly to the camera, too, because we call these things debates, but they're not really, okay? First of all, you're not trying to persuade the other people you're talking to, so it's not a dialogue with the other leaders in which you think that they might change their mind on the basis of what you say, nor is it a high school or university debate where there are judges there going, you got a seven on that answer and an eight on that answer. You're trying to persuade the viewers and you're using the exchange that's happening. So to actually turn away from an argument with the other leader, face the people and say, this is what I believe about that yeah. subject, can be very compelling and very motivating. You can't do it all the time because it looks like you're dismissing the other leaders, mm -hmm. but as much as possible, turn and face and talk to the people you're actually trying to persuade. Okay, just about out of time. One last uh, thought from each of you on what you would say going into the debate to the leader. I'd say it's simple, just be yourself. Uh, people can spot a phony and a robot a million miles away, and at this stage, people watch these debates through the lens of the partisanship that they already hold, so you're really trying to persuade a small group of people that you're A, big enough to be the Prime Minister, and secondly, you're the best choice to be the Prime Minister. Can't best way to do that is yourself. Jamie's right, authenticity is key. You have to be yourself um, and just connect with the viewers. Try to speak to them directly. Last quick word, David. Uh, the debate does not go to the smartest person in the room. It goes mm -hmm. to the person that inspires the most confidence in, in viewers in the room. And so that goes to authenticity. And just really, people are looking at you. Who are you? Mm -hmm. And that's what they're going to take away from it. Don't uh, worry about winning every debating point. Well, I, and I know they're all sitting there watching this right now. <laughs> so they're all taking that advice. You are go to sleep. Go to bed. <laughs> rest up. All right. Thank you all. You can be sure we'll have lots of coverage of what actually happens in the first debate when the National comes your way tomorrow night.